Solana Labs, uh, the crypto forward uh, smartphone saga will be on public sale uh, May 8. This is their phone, Solana's uh, phone, but that's not all Solana's in the news for. Joining us now to discuss that and more is Solana Labs CEO and co-founder Anatoly Yakovenko. Welcome, Anatoly. We, we, we'll, we'll just come back to him. Emily, there was one other thing that's happening this uh, afternoon at about 2, 2.30. We have the Fed expected to uh, raise hikes again, ra raise rates again. And we've been covering that for so long. Uh, can you <laughs> give us a sense of what makes this one different? I don't know that this one will be different. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been, you're right, we've been covering this. It's kind of a Groundhog's Day, you know, they, we have these Fed meetings and um, everybody talks about the impact on Bitcoin's price. And then some people say there will be no impact on Bitcoin's price, but I don't see anything particularly special about today's meeting. We'll probably see a lot of the same narratives resurface again um, about how this affects crypto. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, th there's another point that we've been looking at, and, and that's just trying to understand whether uh, there is a bit of a shift right now in, in just mm -hmm. understanding whether uh, Bitcoin will uh, react at all to the Fed. Um, you know, it, we've been saying things like it's going to hit 45, and then somebody else says it's going to hit 100K. And at the same time, mm -hmm. you have the Fed uh, coming in with a rate hike. And one of the things that our colleague Omkar Godbole has written about is that this is a time when the Fed needs to signal that it will stop these rate hikes. And if it doesn't do so, then Bitcoin uh, could have a stall. It's been rising. It's been, it's been less of a bear market for Bitcoin, of course. But that might change if there's no signal from the, from the Fed. How do you read that? It looks like maybe we have Anatoly back. I'm not sure. Uh, is Anatoly back? Not quite. Not quite. Oh, hi. Can you hear us now? Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, Anatoly, we'll, we'll, we'll ask you questions about the Fed maybe if we get the time. But let's uh, dive straight <laughs> into your uh, phone, uh, Saga. Uh, roughly 10 months ago, uh, Solana first teased the potential of this cell phone uh, that basically doubles as a dedicated crypto hardware wallet. wallet. Just tell us some of these features and, and why you wanted to create this. Yeah, it, it's shipped, it's live, uh, it's really, really cool. The cool thing about this is it's uh, using technology that when I was at Qualcomm, like my close friends had developed. So this creates a secure display and a secure touch interface on the phone that prevents the Android operating system from ever having the, the possibility from ever stealing your keys. And that makes the security in this device as close to a hardware wallet as a phone could allow. So kind of think of it as, you know, the place where, you know, Apple stores your face ID, that secure element in the device is now acting as your hardware wallet. Um, yep. That's really, really important for users. Self-custody is the fundamental part feature of crypto, you know, not your keys, not, not your coins. So I think that was the really one of the key features that we wanted to implement. The other one, I think, is obviously the decentralized app store. You see these big yeah, I companies. To to that. I, I just wanted to come to that. You guys have custom uh, DAP store, uh, which only lists crypto applications. Why did you make the choice to not have extractive fees on the DAP store apps? And, and we, we're seeing this given the contents of how um, an Apple and a Google charge 30% tax on their respective storefronts. You can't charge 30% tax on Web3 assets because the Web3 assets are not owned by the marketplaces. They're owned by the users. And Magic Eden or Tensor cannot ha have 30% higher prices on their mobile app store than they do on their desktop. No user is going to pay $13,000 for, for an NFT that costs 10000 bucks in the marketplace on the desktop. It just doesn't work. And there's no way for these applications to eat that fee because they don't own that content. You have to start treating digital assets like you do physical assets, and that's just not going to happen in these big companies. I think it's going to take somebody to show that there's really a billion dollars worth of revenue to make in Web3 before they change their business models. Um, so, Anatoly, we haven't had you on the show in a while, and a lot has changed since then. And one of the interesting things that has come up is that there's now kind of a lot of new projects out there um, that are flush with capital and that could potentially eat into sort of Solana share. I mean, some of these blockchains are like Sweet, Base, Linea, Scroll. I'm just curious what your strategy is um, kind of in this market that you have a lot of these new players. 
Well, none of them are as fast as Solana do, or do as many transactions as, as Solana or run as many nodes as Solana. So <laughs> I think we're still quite ahead on the technology front. And that technology, I think, is really important to the applications that need it. So you've seen folks like Helium move from their own layer one that they've been working on to Solana. Render moved, voted to move to Solana as well. And this is, you know, I think just a, a sign that like when you really get down to it, Solana, I think, is still far more advanced than uh, all the other uh, blockchains on the market. Just also kind of off of that question again, you haven't been on in a while. Um, Solana was very heavily associated with FTX, as we all know. Um, such a they, the two the two words were often used together. Um, what has been like? How have you sort of filled that hole? Right. I mean, this is you know Solana. Like, let's be honest here for a while. People are like, okay, Solana over, Solana dead. Obviously, it's not. It's not dead, <laughs> but it's far from that. But you know what? How did you sort of recover from that? I mean, given that you know this was such a this was such a massive association with Solana. Well, um, you know, FTX had such an outsized uh, mark, like uh, potential, like <laughs> had such an outsized kind of a place in the marketplace in, in, in terms of crypto. So anything that they did became kind of a, a big deal. And they were building on Solana, you know, they were building a lot of applications. And when they collapsed, that created this massive hole. But the rest of the developers that are building on Solana really had nothing to do with FTX. And you saw that in the last hackathon. We had over 800 projects submitted during that hackathon. That was our largest hackathon ever. So, and that happened basically two months after the FTX collapse. I was obviously holding my breath until that happened. I myself wasn't even sure is this ecosystem going to survive because that's a, you know, even myself, I don't even know the size of it. But after that hackathon happened, after seeing the, the kind of applications people submitted and the devs that are super excited to build these next generation crypto experiences on Solana, I was, you know, finally able to breathe and kind of, you know, look past that whole debacle. And you see really, really innovative things coming out of those uh, developers. Like, I really hope folks go check out Dialect. It's a messaging app. It has built-in messaging that are smart messages. You can send and request crypto transfers. It doesn't even feel like you're using a blockchain. It's cheap and fast, and it, like, feels like what, you know, like you expect crypto to be like, uh, you know, in five years after everyone in the world is using it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting. Uh, Emily brought up FTX, and you brought up the hackathon. Uh, the, the hackathon. Uh, there was one that you just did uh, in India, and I'll come. I'll come to that in just a bit. Uh, but let's just talk a little bit about the FTX uh, situation, because uh, SPF once said Solana is the most underrated token. Uh, today, Dogecoin's creator Billy Marcus has, has tweeted Solana is basically a centralized database, though. It doesn't really solve anything. Um, Misari investors have said that, um, you know, that investors basically hold 37% in Solana and, and therefore there are concerns about centralization. Uh, that's anyway been topical post FTX and other collapses. I, I'm just like asking you to like look into all of this, that there is this, there was SPF who is now completely discredited, who said you are the Solana is the most underrated token. And you have Billy Marcus and others now talking about, uh, you know, centralization. How do you just look at all of this? Well, I mean, you got to look at the actual facts on the ground. Solana is the second largest network by node count uh, in terms of smart contract networks. Like in that, those are independently, mostly independent nodes. They're run by operators all around the world. You look at the distribution of those nodes, it's as big as Ethereum's like globally. Um, Solana is in more data centers than most networks have nodes to begin with. So from a decentralization perspective, it is a very hard to you know kill network. There's always going to be at least one operator that survives with a copy of the state. And that's the fundamental thing that decentralization provides, is that ability to recover from catastrophic failures. So very, very far from what AWS is. Um, and in terms of like developers and impact to the market, you just can't build the kinds of applications that you can build on Solana anywhere else. This is why the chain handles more transactions per day than all the other networks combined. You know, even when we have outages, you look at the, the amount of transactions that Solana handles during an outage, it's more than the, all the other networks. And that, that's really kind of the, the most underrated part. Um, all the kind of development in that layer twos in terms of scale, all the 
next generation layer ones, they haven't even caught up to what Solana is today on the technology side. And we're already building you know, the next version of Solana. There's an uh, external team totally outside of Solana itself without any of the lab's employees building a second implementation of the Solana client in a different language. And that's going to provide you know, client diversity, which is really important in terms of you know, decentralization just just from team aspect, team aspect, but also reliability from liveness and security. It's very hard for two different teams to create the same bug in two different code bases in different languages. So I think we are already kind of ahead of everyone else and moving even further ahead. I think from my perspective, the gap is just getting wider. So Solana in the past, you know, was definitely one of these, um, it was definitely called an ETH killer, right? That would, they were often, you know, that term was often used. Now, the term ETH killer has become a lot less trendy in crypto. You don't hear it very often, and I feel like people don't really like it. I feel like you kind of just described Solana as like an everything killer, basically. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious what, what you think of the term ETH killer. I mean, is that, just, is that term just completely outdated, and should we just move on? I know that in some ways, like, Solana is actually sort of cooperating with ETH, but I'm just curious, like, how you look at that whole debate, which was, you know, quite hot for a while. It's impossible for, uh, the, it was impossible for Microsoft to kill Linux. And that was the biggest technology company in the world with the biggest reach, trying to kill a group of devs that were working on the weekends for fun. You know, as long as there's developers built, having fun and building an Ethereum, it's not going to be killed. Same thing about Solana. That's really kind of the magic of the space of decentralization, of open source, and that's, I think, really, really wonderful. That's amazing, right? It, it's just a bunch of devs that are building open source software and nothing can kill them. Um, in terms of like, when people compare, like, what does it mean to kill ETH? I think they have a specific metric in their head that they really care about and they wanna see somebody else get ahead of Ethereum on that. And as these networks develop, they're gonna occupy different niches in the space. It's very possible that in five, 10 years, Ethereum still has the most TVL out of any chain. Does that mean that it won? Like, I think you have to ask yourself, what is it that you care about? What we care about when we're building Solana is maximizing the number of users and use cases that are using the chain. And to me, that means making it as cheap and as fast as possible and providing that level of decentralization that cannot, you know, you cannot kill the network. You cannot create a fault or corruption of the state. So that's really what we care about. Do you have any sense of the geographical distribution of Solana users? I mean, I know we probably don't have exact numbers about that, but where are some of the active Solana communities worldwide? Like anything that people might be surprised by or not know about? Um, we've seen posts from folks like Phantom that, that show the dis, you know distribution of their users in terms of users that you know use the Phantom wallet. Um, some of the surprising things is that I would say like US accounts, maybe 30 to 40%. But uh, the rest of the world is very important, I think, for crypto. And I think that's been something that um, most folks are very US-centric when they talk about regulation and everything else. But in terms of users, I would say the super majority of users are outside of the United States. Yeah. Where you know, in particular? Any, just any countries in particular that stand out? I'm just curious like, if there's any really hot markets for Solana that people might not know about. Yeah, we've had like um, awesome hacker houses in Vietnam, in Malaysia, in like Southeast Asia. And that's been really surprising. You see a lot of really talented developers that get the nuance of crypto, they get the benefits of it, that are ready to jump in and build world class applications at global scale. That's That's been really cool to see. I think it was one of your co-founders in India uh, who who might have mentioned this in an article of the Economic Times that refers to this as India is the second largest market for Solana. Uh, and Solana's second hackathon in India was the only other instance of Solana holding more than one edition of a hackathon in a region outside the U.S. Uh, um, just tell us about uh, what your plans are for a country like India, which is very well known for developers and, and that environment. But at the same time, the regulation out there is, well, to say the least, not friendly. Uh, well, a lot of devs in India are oh, awesome, amazing devs are able to build applications at a global scale. So a lot of the developers that approach us there are there to build apps for the entire global market outside of India. It's, it's almost similar to the United States. The developers, they understand the nuance of local regulation and building applications for the global market. Um, and uh, India, from my perspective, is like almost um, you know a mature market because of just the sheer number of engineers that are there. 
that are very talented and are able to build applications, you know, bootstrap from zero to one in, in like a couple of weekends. Uh, it's been really amazing uh, working with those folks. Okay. All right. Uh, just one, one final question about uh, the phone. Uh, how will Solana Mobile uh, manage approvals or revoke access on its uh, DAP store? Because we say this because there was this app called Tulip, and you can probably throw some light on this. It had they had there were allegations lobbed at it, and then Solana Mobile hid it from the DAP store. But later you reapproved it. What's going on? <laughs> Yeah, it's just like every other DApp store. There's a moderation uh, happening right now. It's run by Solana mobile team. Um, it's just much faster than what you'd expect out of Apple or Google. It's not going to take you weeks. It takes you know days to hours because we're a much smaller team and are able to move faster. The long-term vision for this, though, is for us to give up the moderation to communities so users will be able to subscribe to different channels. Yeah, no, I was just wondering why, you know, what happens is that when this kind of a thing happens, nobody understands what's happening internally at Solana. And there was, there's, there's this, this is like a dose of discredited, uh, you know, a perception uh, when, um, when this kind of a thing happens. So how do you just like manage that is my point. I mean, we, of course, we understood what was happening internally. There was some accusations with data that look credible that made us, people feel confident that they should take some action. And then you have to dig into it and actually look through the data and get to a conclusion, right? That, that, that process runs on every moderation store, right? So it's just, it's just much, much faster on Solana than you would expect out of Apple or Google. Uh, just quickly, um, NFTs, Solana's a big player in the NFT space. NFT space has been very notably cooling down. Can you just tell us a little bit about your outlook for uh, Solana NFTs? Well, um, there's been, I think, close to 3 million NFTs minted in Solana over the last like month and a half. And this includes things like Helium NFT hotspots. This includes Dialect sticker packs. And like, I think close to a million, like Drip House, like NFT airdrops. So because of state, uh, state compression, a technology that we rolled out over the last several months, the price to mint an NFT has dropped to about 130 bucks for a million NFTs. And those kind of unit economics just change the kind of use cases you can start deploying with NFTs. So to me, that's been really, really exciting to watch. Uh, volumes wise, I think Solana had some of its largest days in volume, like Mad Lads had like a, a crazy NFT launch. Um, what was really cool for me to see is that during that launch, the Web2 infra had, was handling like hundreds of millions of requests per second, uh, but there was no impact on the chain. Like localized fee markets, the technology that we rolled out yes, last year, uh, really proved that you can isolate a very hot NFT mint at the same time while serving DeFi liquidations and Oracle updates without spiking gas prices. So gas prices on Solana remained as cheap as ever, while this, this like, you know, one of the biggest NFT launches in crypto history happened. Um, in terms of like whether those launches, you know, are possible, where we're going to see a hundred of those this year or, or five or one or, or no more, that's really hard to predict. I think NFTs are a very fickle market. They very depend on the macro conditions. People get more excited about more things when the entire crypto market goes up. Um, but you still see talented teams ha like have these outside successes and be able to catch lightning in a bottle. Um, and to me, it's exciting that it's happening in Solana. Uh, just finally, you know, we talked about ETH for a second, but I feel like we also have to mention Polygon, which is just another chain that's very often used in the same sentence as Solana. And, you know, Polygon's been doing pretty well recently, hearing about it a lot. And I'm just curious, like, do you still see that as a main competitor? And, you know, um, what are some of Solana's advantages vis-a-vis -vis Polygon? I mean, technology-wise, I think Solana is leaps and bounds ahead of Polygon if, in terms of finality, throughput, gas costs, everything else. Um, so you just can't run the same applications that you can on Solana uh, on Polygon. So from our perspective, I think uh, all the Layer 2s are ending up in this kind of similar bucket where their performance characteristics are similar to the Ethereum L1. There's just more of them. But that doesn't really change the kind of things you can do in crypto. You're still dealing with these kind of slow, high, uh, you know, high fee based applications, and those don't scale to 100 million users. It's important to note that even uh, Polygon uh, <coughs> has their own phone. 
so I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll try to get a comment from Polygon about what you just said. Uh, but, but we appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, uh, Solana Lab CEO and co-founder Anatoly uh, Yakovenko, uh, much appreciated you joining us and we, we hope to have you back uh, very soon.